Hey guys, it's Emma Bigling with TYT Politics. I'm here with Jess King. Jessica King, uh, you're running for Congress in Pennsylvania's 16th district, which is kind of west of Philadelphia, but pretty close by. Um, you're a Justice Democrat, and I have read that you are running on a platform of both Medicare for All and tuition-free college, which both of those issues are hugely popular in the country and obviously uh, have a lot of progressive support behind them. Can you talk about those aspects of your platform and in general just why you're running? Absolutely. Um, I am born and raised in this community, so this is my home community. I came back after uh, 10 years in Pittsburgh, so I've spent all of my life in Pennsylvania. And I think that uh, we're at a moment that we need to speak to the economic challenges that working families have. Uh, I know this from personal experience and from my work in Pennsylvania. Uh, I have a long history of supporting business owners and starting new businesses and growing their businesses here in Lancaster and doing uh, affordable housing and community development in Pittsburgh too. And so I know the economic struggles of our community. And so I know also that the, the biggest uh, expenses that are rising for working families are medical expenses, higher ed, and child care for working families. So those are the kind of things that I'm totally committed to around speaking to the economic issues that people are struggling with in this country. Uh, and, you know, Medicare for all, I think, is the way to go. A single payer system is the most efficient, effective way to cover uh, everyone in this country. I think healthcare is a right and not a privilege, and we need to have a, a way to make sure that everyone is covered. I think economic populism is so important because we populism has been essentially co-opted by a lot of people That's on the so right to this kind of uh, ra racist rhetoric when economic populism is really what's popular in this country. Medicare for all, polling above water without anyone on TV talking about it, um, yeah. etc. So you talk a little bit about your work uh, in Pennsylvania and why that makes you a particularly uh, good candidate to address economic issues. You are the executive director of an economic development organization called Assets. Can you talk about how that's informed your uh, opinions on these matters and oh, what, totally. you've, what you've observed about kind of the poor and middle class in America? Absolutely. You know, I grew up in a small business family, so my parents owned a paint store and a painting company, and that's I started working there when I was eight. So I totally get this idea of achieving the American dream. My parents didn't have college degrees. My stepdad didn't even finish high school. And so this was like a dream that, that was accessible to them and that they supported four kids on through, you know, helped us grow up and we learned how to work through that environment. And so I've been supporting business owners, especially with a focus on women and women and men of color so that our economy can look more like our community. And Lancaster, where I am in central Pennsylvania is a really racially and culturally diverse community. Uh, we see business ownership as an opportunity for people to achieve that American dream, you know, the quintessential American dream. But what I've seen, you know, and we do training and lending, we want to run a women's business center, we provide credit building microloans to entrepreneurs that want to start their own business. And one of the things that we see most often is that people who are coming to us who can't get loans to start their own businesses, uh, they have issues with their credit. Uh, and most of the reasons that they have issues with their credit are medical collections. So these are folks who are working, you know, they're working to get by. They're trying to achieve the American dream, but they can't access capital to grow their businesses because they didn't make enough money to pay for health insurance. They, they made too much to get any kind of assistance. And so they've been left putting the bill and they can't afford it. And so that's just one example for me of seeing the literal effects of our broken health care policy on business. You know, this is not this is not anti-business uh, rhetoric. It's not anti-business policy. And I think we as progressives of Democrats need to be able to embrace that and say, you know, the number one reason people don't start small businesses right now in this country is because they can't afford to leave their employer sponsored health care. Like it's a broken system when people can't follow their dreams, pursue an opportunity that they see. And so I think that these are like common sense, business oriented, economic uh, sort of, you know, people talk about fiscal moderation. I think single payer is actually like a more efficient, more effective way to go. Well, the studies have shown that it is, and that's because it's not about the the conversation has been co-opted. It's not about growing the economy and doing what's best for the economy. It's what's doing best for the what's best for the current actors, the current uh, large corporations that now have a stranglehold over uh, our government. And 
when you talk about health care, it's so important to note that your district is currently being represented by Lloyd Smucker, which is a, a crazy name. Um, uh, and he supported the Obamacare repeal. Uh, and, and he, you know, in addition to our discussion about health care, he's against gay rights, abortion, all of those social issues, and also uh, has been uh, really bad on climate change and is yeah. opposing any regulation on greenhouse gas emissions. Can you talk about your opponent? And I think a lot differentiates you, but what specifically differentiates you? Absolutely. I mean, he's he's pretty much uh, party line with Speaker Ryan and voting with Trump 97% of the time. Um, so he's really pretty much in line with the party. And we believe this is an opportunity in Trump country. This is a district that Trump won by seven points. Um, we believe a progressive Democrat can run by speaking, run and win by speaking to issues that, that speak to working families, populist, progressive ideas that resonate with people in their pocketbooks. And they're the same kind of things that Trump talked about. And then the same, the same kind of thing that, that my opponent talks about, but it's all, it's, it's, it's frankly not true, you know, and their, their approach to tax reform of saying it's going to put more money in people's pockets is just not true. Um, and so we need to talk about the things that are affecting people and, and promote common sense, good ideas that actually move the needle uh, for folks. And so, yeah, Lloyd Smucker is just a, a pretty traditional Democrat or pretty traditional Republican in this environment. And we think we can we can beat him by speaking to the issues that matter to people. And we see Pennsylvania. I mean, Pennsylvania went for Trump after going for Obama twice on issues of economic populism. And so those are the things that we need to talk about. We need to own them and we need to speak to families directly about those issues. So speaking of, you know, the Democratic Party has lost populism. Um, I mean, Bernie Sanders, his rise kind of brought it back. But the, the consensus within the party establishment was that those politics weren't effective because they didn't or they weren't good enough because they didn't appease the corporate interests enough. And there are multiple Democrats running in your primary to take on Representative Smucker. I don't know why it makes me laugh. Um, so uh, what what makes you stand out uh, besides the obvious, the Justice Democrat not taking corporate money? Uh, what, what makes you stand out in that primary race? Yeah. So we're running on a progressive platform, Medicare for All, debt-free uh, public college, um, increasing supports for working families like child care, um, addressing the Puerto Rican debt crisis. This district has 72,000 Puerto Rican constituents, the highest number of any House Republican. It's a very interesting district in so many ways. We're also expecting like 10,000 more people coming from Puerto Rico after the hurricane. So this is a, the changing demographics of this district are, are really, really interesting. And I think, um, you know, just really uh, allow us to speak to progressive issues in a way that resonate with people. The other thing that differentiates us is that we're already knocking on doors. We're talking to people and we're organizing people in a big way to engage their neighbors, to mobilize people to vote, to engage them in a politics of hope and not a politics of division and fear. And saying that there is so much at stake in this kind of election and so much at stake in our country right now, and that it's a moral failure if we don't get our diverse constituency in this, in this district to engage and to vote. And those are the ways that we can win and flip a red, a red seat to blue. Um, and lastly, uh, your district is close to Philadelphia. Phil Philadelphia is a very blue city, um, as a lot of cities are, and they just elected a really progressive DA, uh, Larry mm -hmm. Krasner, who has really taken uh, the state by storm, I think, um, and, and yeah. really surprised a lot of people. He supports ending the death penalty, uh, ending mass incarceration. He's a supporter of activist groups like Black Lives Matter. Um, I think I know where you stand on those issues, but just for the record, do you agree with his platform? Very much. I find it really, really hopeful, both on how he ran and how the community surrounded him in that run, and that he pulled off a beautiful upset in that race to say that a progressive politics that actually is in line with people first and thinking about the well-being of people, thinking about um, the common good and how we invest in people with long-term solutions versus short-term rhetoric. I just feel like what he stands for and what he ran on is so much about highlighting the issues and the broken nature of our system right now and so much around race and class that aren't working in this country. And it's, I just find it very, very hopeful that um, – what he stands to do with uh, in a large city with their justice system is going to be a, a really, really interesting and hopeful thing for our country. 
I know I said that was the last question, but I have one more because yeah. <laughs> I really I like talking to you. Um, m marijuana. Uh, I my I'm from Jersey, and uh, uh, Phil Murphy, who just won in that state, ran on a legalization of marijuana platform, which was pretty progressive for a guy who was a Goldman Sachs executive. Um, where do you stand on that issue? Do you think Phil, uh, Pennsylvania could find its way to legalizing marijuana anytime soon? I, you know, I think it's part of the, the rhetoric right now in the state. So we um, legalize medical marijuana, and that's rolling out right now. And I think, you know, for me, I look at this as having lived and worked in low-income communities of color and seen what our um, kind of backwards policing and, um, and sort of uh, penalties for marijuana possession, the impact that has had on communities of color in our state. Um, and I, I think just at a very, at a moral level, the benefits to the community, when you look at other states and other, um, other cities that have either decriminalized or legalized marijuana, there, it's, it's been a very, very positive experience. So I think obviously that's a, that's, you know, a conversation for Pennsylvania as a whole, as a federal, um, uh, congressional, candidate, I'm very interested in seeing that that movement towards legalizing marijuana in this country. Thanks so much. much bleh, thanks so much. I know my brain's already in Thanksgiving. So uh, have a great rest of uh, your week and happy Thanksgiving. You thanks, you for talking. thanks so much. It's really nice to talk to you. Agreed.